Good morning. Uh, this will be the first of very regular briefings that you'll be receiving as we head into the trial of Derek Chauvin. Uh, those briefings will get more and more regular with respect to safety and security and general preparations for the trial as we head, head closer and closer to both jury deliberations as well as the verdict. Um, today's briefing is predominantly focused on some of the outreach and engagement we're going to have in the community and some of the work that we are doing here at the City Enterprise. That work has been ongoing. Uh, it really began late last summer. Uh, culminated in December when we requested the National Guard from the governor and I can tell you that the people here standing with me have been working their tail off to make sure that all of these safety and security items are addressed throughout our city. Uh, specific areas of law enforcement will be handled uh, by another press conference later today at the EOTF. However, Chief Arredondo is here with us right now and will be get able to give you a, a general overview of the work that law enforcement is doing and I can tell you that it will be substantial. I think I speak for everyone that is standing here with me when I say that, that safety is a top priority through this very difficult time in our city. We need to make sure that our communities, our businesses, families throughout the city are safe and feel safe regardless of where they live and regardless of where they've worked. And as we've seen in so many other cities, as we lead into trials involving black men that have been killed uh, by the police officers, there's great frustration, there's anxiety, uh, and there's trauma. We anticipate that trauma increasing as we get closer into jury deliberations uh, and the verdict. And we believe that it is on us to honor the magnitude of this moment and ensure that our families in this city feel safe. Uh, with this in mind, we have been working with painstaking detail uh, to make sure we're working with our other partners, our other jurisdictions. Uh, there are 12 other jurisdictions assisting us in the form of mutual aid, uh, as was mentioned earlier by the National Guard, uh, where they will and can reach peak capacity of up to 2,000 National Guard uh, members, uh, as well as up to 1,100 law enforcement coming from a number of different mutual aid jurisdictions. We're very appreciative of their assistance. Um, there, so here's what you can expect in, in the coming weeks and over the next couple of months. First, uh, as I mentioned, there will be an increasing presence uh, of law enforcement. That, that will increase throughout the trial uh, and will reach full capacity as we move closer into both jury deliberations as well as the jury verdict. As I mentioned, it's around 2,000 National Guard at peak capacity and up to 2,000 uh, with 1,100 law enforcement from 12 different jurisdictions. The second piece, uh, 38th in Chicago. Uh, will remain closed to vehicular traffic. We recognize that, that this is a space uh, for healing. We recognize that throughout the trial itself, people will want to gather, they'll want to protest, they'll want to express their First Amendment rights, and we want to enable them to do so safely uh, and peacefully. Uh, that being said, the intersection at 38th and Chicago, as I mentioned on Friday, will receive robust city services, everything ranging from snow removal to uh, street maintenance uh, to EMS uh, and 911 response. Um, we have that obligation to those in the area uh, to, to keep that intersection moving, but yes, it will be closed through uh, to vehicular traffic. We'll also be working closely with both uh, our Office of Violence Prevention, as well as our neighborhood and community outreach teams. What we want to establish this time uh, in a more enhanced fashion is a two-way communication. Two-way communication between residents and communities of our city, especially our BIPOC communities and our city enterprise itself, so that we can both receive and disseminate information in as efficient a way as possible. That's something where I feel you'll see a great improvement, and I'll have both our directors, Sasha Cotton and David Rubidor, speaking here very shortly on that topic. Uh, no doubt there will be disruption downtown in the form of street closures. Uh, however, our public works team has been working with a number of neighboring jurisdictions to ensure that we have as full transit access as possible and that there are minimal delays and disruption. Uh, finally, I, I mentioned uh, regular communication. Um, we very much appreciate the work of this press corps here to disseminate information as quickly and as timely as possible. I'll also note that as these briefings get increasingly regular and frequent, it's likely that you'll receive the same information multiple times. That is intentional. Uh, last go around, there was a 
many disinformation campaigns that were going on simultaneously, and we've found that one of the best way to relay information uh, and to have the message get across is to say it multiple times. And so you can expect to hear the same information multiple times, but we will uh, be having those very regular uh, briefings. So you know, in conclusion, the, the, pe the people of Minneapolis have, have stepped up. They've stepped up to hold us as a city enterprise accountable, uh, whether that is elected officials or department heads. Uh, they've made sure to hold leadership accountable and demand a more equitable and just city. The responsibility is on all of us. It's on, it's on leaders, it's on community, uh, it's on our, our, our city staff and, and, our, and our workers to stay focused on public safety in the coming weeks because that has to remain a top priority and I can assure you it will. Uh, the first uh, up to speak after me is our, our council member, Jamal Osman. He's our newest city council member and he has been a, an excellent partner throughout. Um, council member. Good morning. I'm a council member, Jamal Osman. I represent Ward 6 in the central Minneapolis. Last summer, Minneapolis was the center of international tragedy, which challenged everyone in the city, but was felt most by our black, brown, native, and immigrant communities. Decades of broken promise and mistrust led to a situation where a lot of residents, it was easy for them to believe a rumors and gossip too often it led to increase of fear. Now as we enter this next chapter, the city must do better. And we are prepared with plans to do much better to keep people safe. Public safety is our number one goal, but safety goes hand in hand with good communication and strong relationships. And we know that people are safer, safer if they have timely and accurate information to make informed decisions. The city is prepared to do a better job reaching out to communities they might have not reached out before. People like young people, immigrants, and non-English speakers. Likewise, there are plans to reach out, to reach out using every social media outlet and array of community stakeholders. The East African and immigrant communities I represent have a long mistrust of government, both here and abroad. This mistrust is matched by our black and brown communities in Minneapolis. The first step, is free, the first step of rebuilding trust is honest and good communication. The city cannot control what happens across the street in the courtroom, but we, we can control our future how honest, how transparent, and how direct we are in communicating with our affected uh, communities. I believe today is a good first step. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Osman. Next up is our Chief Arredondo, and I want to relay how hard he has been working over the last approximately eight months in collaboration with a number of different jurisdictions, mutual aid partners, and of course our uh, Department of Public Safety at the state. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Governor Walls for his willingness to, to partner and, 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 and assist our city. Uh, that partnership has been very necessary for our entire state, and we very much appreciate it. Uh, Chief Arredondo. Uh, Madera Arredondo, Chief of the Minneapolis Police Department. I want to thank Mayor Fry for your leadership throughout the past eight months, who's really led from the front, uh, has really been um, supportive of making sure that for the city of Minneapolis and certainly for the MPD, uh, that we have the, uh, the resources we need to, again, this is about public safety, about community safety and keeping our city safe. Um, we've been at this now in planning for the last uh, eight months. And I want to thank our, our mutual aid partners, uh, both local, uh, county, and state, uh, along with our National Guard for assisting us uh, in this endeavor. Uh, as the mayor indicated, we will have a uh, press conference this afternoon with those mutual aid partners and can go into more details uh, related to that. 
Um, two big keys in terms of prevention and public safety uh, is what Councilmember Osmond alluded to. It's time and communication. We're very fortunate that we've had enough time to plan and try to go over those plans, uh, quite, quite honestly, over and over again so that we have the best plans that we can present to the mayor and other stakeholders, or other leaders, to make sure that we're doing all we can to ensure our city's safety. Uh, the other key piece, uh, Councilmember Osmond mentioned about honest, transparent communication. I've had the time to do that. Uh, while I'm standing before you this uh, afternoon, I will tell you that uh, I've been in conversations with our community stakeholders uh, for the last several months, and that communication is key. Communication is key to de-escalation. Communication is key to uh, making sure that our communities are educated and aware of these plans. And the number one goal, again, is the public safety and the prevention of harm to our communities. So that will continue to be our focus as we move forward. Um, uh, Mayor Fry uh, continues to get briefed by me on these details and plans each and every day, and we'll uh, continue to work with our mutual aid partners. But uh, I'm, I'm very, again, thankful for uh, the cooperation, the assistance that so many of our mutual aid partners around the state have offered. And um, again, we'll have a press conference later this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Thank you so much for your leadership. Uh, next up is our Chief Tyner. Uh, the Minneapolis Fire Department has been planning for the possibility of civil unrest surrounding the trial of Derek Chauvin, uh, and our Chief is making sure to expect the unexpected and, and be prepared in every single sense. Chief. Thank you. My name is Brian Tyner. I am Fire Chief of the Minneapolis Fire Department. Uh, you know, the mayor and, and uh, Chief Rondo, Chief Arredondo, has pretty much said it all. So I will just take this opportunity to reassure the public that the Minneapolis Fire Department has spent uh, many months leading up uh, to today planning both independently and collaboratively with our partners both locally and throughout the state with the shared goal of ensuring public safety uh, for events that might happen due to the Derek Chauvin trial. We have also secured agreements uh, with our mutual aid partners, uh, both our normal mutual aid partners and uh, through the state of Minnesota for, with uh, mutual aid partners around, to around the state to uh, assist us if needed. And so uh, with that, I will uh, hand it back to the mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Tyner. Thank you for your preparation. Next up is our city attorney, Jim Router, who's going to give an overall synopsis of what to expect during the trial itself, as well as a timeline. Thank you, Mayor. Good morning. My name is Jim Router. Uh, that's spelled R-O-W-A-D-E-R. -E and I just want to provide a little high-level overview of what we can expect here uh, with the trial schedule in the coming uh, weeks and months. Uh, pending the outcome of the latest appeal by the prosecution, uh, the trial of former officer Derek Chauvin will begin the week of March 8th with preliminary motions and jury selection at the Hennepin County District Court uh, Courthouse downtown here in Minneapolis. And as you know, Hennepin County District Court Judge Peter Cahill is the presiding judge. Cameras will be allowed in the courtroom and the proceedings will be live streamed. Uh, until all the preliminary motions are heard by Judge Cahill, uh, he will spend one hour each morning addressing preliminary motions and then moving on to jury selection for the rest of that day. Uh, after the jury is selected and sworn in by the judge, uh, the trial will move ahead with opening statements uh, on March 29th, state, uh, starting with the prosecution team. And following opening statements, uh, the prosecution will call their witnesses. The defense then will present their case um, and starting with their opening statement, most likely, and calling their witnesses. Then the trial will finally proceed to closing arguments, and the jury will be sequestered and deliberate until they reach a verdict. And we expect this whole process to uh, last until about mid to late April. So thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. City Attorney. Next is uh, Brett Jelly, our Interim Director of Public Works, and is going to describe what to expect in terms of transit access as well as any street closures. Mr. Jelly. Thank you, Mayor. 
Good morning. My name is Brett Jelly, and I am the interim director of the Public Works Department. Last name is spelled H-J-E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. Public Works has been coordinating closely with Hennepin County, law enforcement, and building facilities managers on security perimeters for the upcoming trial. Our transportation goals are to support the security effort while preserving access to buildings and for downtown. And our approach has been to use the available space to make sure that we're minimizing sidewalk and bike lane closures by repurposing uh, travel and parking lanes. And this is possible because of just general lower traffic volumes in downtown. Visitors to the area can expect consolidated access to some of the government buildings as well as skyway and tunnel access changes again to Hennepin County and, and city buildings. Uh, more information is on those uh, changes is forthcoming. On March 1st, 6th Street South will be closed, and that's the street and the sidewalk between 3rd and 4th Avenues. Currently, other streets will remain open. However, future conditions may warrant additional street and sidewalk closures. Uh, LRT will continue to operate on March 1st, and again, any changes to that will be part of our regular updates. As the trial progresses, we'll be providing regular updates as access changes, and please follow any of the city's social media outlets for the latest. Thank you. Thank you, Interim Director. Next, we have our Director of Economic Development and our Community Planning and Eco Economic Development Department, uh, Eric Hansen, who's going to give a rundown of what uh, businesses and, in some cases, residents should expect in terms of. Thank you, Mayor. My name is Eric Hansen, E-R-I-K-H-A-N-S-E-N. -E I'm the Director of Economic Policy and Development for the city. And either due to the pandemic, the unrest, or both, businesses in Minneapolis have had a tough 13 months. The impact from last year's unrest is still visible in many areas of our city, and businesses and property owners are asking the city what they need to know to prepare their properties to secure, to secure and safe areas for their workers and customers. First, Minneapolis is open for business. For those thinking of where to shop this spring, we want you to think local first. It is very important that we all work together to try and weather this pandemic. And this is a very critical time in uh, businesses' lives in Minneapolis. Second, business and property owners may choose to take additional precautions during the trial. In addition to the advice we've received from Chiefs Arredondo and Tyner, we recommend you consider overall emergency preparedness plans. Ready.gov online has sample plans for businesses that can give you a sense of what questions to consider. During, the during this time period, you also might want to consider adding physical barriers, such as boarding or permanent security gates. You m we, we suggest that you check in with your insurance company to make sure that your insurance policies are up to date. People might want to consider uploading important documents and records online to online cloud services, for example, like Dropbox or Google Drive, or bring physical copies of these documents to an off-site location. We want businesses and property owners to continue to build connections with their neighbors and to share contact information in case the um, need arises to connect with your neighbors. And if you do choose to do additional security personnel, the city suggests that you use a licensed security company, which will have a fully trained um, staff with their own insurance. And finally, the city is committed to working with our businesses and property owners through this um, time. Uh, much of the advice you have today is not only from our learnings we had um, from last year, but also from questions we're getting directly from businesses and community groups. We'll continue to work with our community groups and our businesses on this advice and provide additional information and regular updates with the mayor, as he stated earlier, as we pre prepare for this uncertain phase. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hansen. Next, uh, we'll have David Rubidor, Director of our Neighborhood Community Relations Department, uh, who is going to give a rundown on the toolkit that he's been creating for neighborhoods to allow for that constant and two-way line of communication. Thank you, Mayor. Good morning. Uh, my name is David Rubidor. Last name is spelled R-U-B-E-D-O-R. And as the mayor mentioned, I'm going to speak to the communication and engagement plans for the city um, during the trial. 
As you've heard from the mayor and a number of speakers today, we recognize that communication and engagement with the community through the trial is going to be critically important, and we're building a plan to work in partnership with community, community organizations, and our neighborhood groups to really support um, communication with the city and understanding what is actually transpiring um, in our city. So throughout the trials, uh, throughout the trial, the communications and the engagement um, teams will be working with our partners. Uh, from multiple jurisdictions and a joint information system to keep the public informed um, using a coordinated communications and engagement strategy. In a minute, I'll go through a little bit more detail about what those strategies will be. Our goal is to work with the community directly to create multiple channels, both on the ground as well as online, to share timely, relevant information and receive ongoing feedback and understanding of what is happening. Our key public messages will focus on providing accurate overall information to the public, identifying and dispelling rumors, addressing community trauma related to the trial, providing details of the trial such as date, time, and location, and providing details about law enforcement, public safety, street and traffic plans at the key sites around the city, um, with particular focus in on downtown near the Government Center, 38th and Chicago, Lake Street, uh, West Broadway, and other commercial corridors, the police precincts, as well as other government buildings. As I mentioned, we have several strategies that we are going to be employing in order to build um, that relationship and communication with community, and I'll highlight those. First is identifying community partners and convening a group of community members and leaders um, to work with us in two-way communication, real-time communication, to bring the community voice into the joint information system, as well as being able to share out information uh, quickly. The purpose of this is really to make sure that we understand what the community needs are, what information is required, and what, what type of messages need to be conveyed in a way that would be understood by community members. We're also expanding local media partnerships. So we will be partnering with black-led media outlets as well as local media outlets to reach our non-English speaking communities or um, the outlets that are able to reach uh, residents who don't normally rely on mainstream media or city channels for their news. An example of that is the city currently has a number of radio programs um, that are geared towards the African American, Latino, East African, and Southeast Asian communities. We will be expanding the schedule of these radio programs to be weekly with the option of being able to add additional programs um, if needed. In addition to that, we are expanding our social media presence. Um, we are identifying and working with community members who are considered trusted messengers within their community and that have a large social media presence so that we are able to convey shared, uh, verified, accurate information from the city and also really uh, re receive real-time information from the community. And finally, we will be continuing to work with our existing information networks, um, partners that we have dealt with and worked with for many years, which includes our neighborhood organizations and other groups that are on the ground working with our residents on a daily basis to be able to um, understand um, uh, what is happening as well as being able to convey uh, uh, information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Director Rubidor. Finally, our director of the Office of Violence Prevention, Sasha Cotton, who will share a bit more of a toolkit uh, as to how she's going to be working with neighborhood and community groups and some of the outreach that her team has been doing. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> I'm Sasha Cotton, the director of the Minneapolis Office of Violence Prevention in the Minneapolis Health Department. Uh, as the mayor stated, our office will be working specifically to develop a toolkit for neighborhood groups and individual blocks to think about ways to preserve community safety. Uh, that is our number one priority. We are also working with a number of groups on the ground. Director Rubidor alluded to um, some of the work that they're doing and we're working in, or excuse me, spoke candidly about the work that they're doing. And we will be partnering with them to ensure that communities that are often most impacted by violence are getting and receiving information as well as being able to translate information back up to the city about their needs on the ground during the trial. We know that trauma unfortunately is unlikely and triggers for trauma uh, may come out of these experiences and we want to make sure that the city is taking every opportunity that it can to mitigate those traumas and help our communities to thrive through this experience. So thank you very much and uh, that's all. Thank you. We'll open to questions.